Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm just gonna dive right in, um, in honor of the five minutes. So first, I use this in my upper division biology class, but this is an activity that can really be used in any class, whether it's lower division, upper division, biology, non-biology. Um, and so at my institution, like many universities, we have students with really diverse levels of preparedness, support, um, outside obligations. So I'm particularly interested in inclusive and equitable teaching practices, particularly those that foster the acquisition of a growth mindset. Um, and so that's because there's evidence that indicates that growth mindset can really move the bar on performance or opportunity gaps. And this is really important in STEM because we see a disproportionate rate of attrition of students from marginalized um, and underrepresented backgrounds. And so if you look at my little graphic of what is supposed to be a growing brain, um, there are four growth mindset concepts next to it. And those are the concepts that I really try to address in this activity. Okay, so the activity. Um, it is centered around a summative assessment. In my class, that means an exam, but you could use it for a lab report or a paper. Um, there are three pieces. Two, I couple together the goal setting and time management. We do those pieces three weeks before the exam. Um, and then after students get their grade back, we do uh, what I call a debugging activity. So Sam, if you'll take me to the next slide. I will go over the activities in a little more detail. So for goal setting, I use something called the DAPS method. Uh, it stands for dated, achievable, personal, positive, and specific. And so I think the most important piece is helping students set achievable uh, goals. And so that's gonna be different for all of our students. So some students, you know, maybe they're, they have a really heavy course load, they're working, they have a lot of other outside obligations. Maybe an achievable goal for them is 82%. Um, maybe a student has more time, less constraints, so an achievable goal is 95%. So I give them the freedom to kind of um, figure out what's achievable for them and to make sure that goal is personal to them. Um, it's not another goal. Uh, someone has the expectation of them, it's their goal. Positive meaning not, um, I, you know, I'm not gonna fail <laughs> to turn that on its head and say I'm going to pass and not just pass, but I'm going to get 73%. Um, and with this, I give them a list of suggested strategies for studying. So it's my way to kind of sneak in some study skills um, education. So to teach them different ways to effectively study and actively engage with the material. Um, and this is also a nice time to kind of talk, talk about giving them some guidance on course load. So maybe if you're taking 18 units with a lot of upper division um, tough classes, maybe it's time to pair that back um, if they want to have higher goals that they can set for themselves. And um, so the time management piece. Uh, again, I do this at the same time. I distribute a calendar. And again, it's going to be for three weeks. I have them write down their goal on, of their grade on the exam day. And then for the three weeks prior, I have them write down how they're going to work towards that goal each day. So it's a way of um, helping to couple their effort to their output. I provided a little snapshot of what one week of the calendar looks like. I try to provide enough space so they can write down not just what they're doing for my class, but for other classes as well or work uh, to honor that they have other things going on in their lives and they should consider that when they're thinking about time management. And um, this also allows me to convey, convey how much effort is involved with learning that yes, it's challenging, uh, but we should embrace that challenge and attempt to make learning a daily practice, you know, as opposed to just cramming the night before an exam. Um, and I wanted to add that evidence indicates that when students create these kinds of to-do lists, they're more likely to accomplish their, their tasks. There's something about the act of writing down a, something that they're gonna accomplish. It makes them feel more obliged to accomplish it. Um, okay, last piece, the debugging. So I love this piece. It follows the exam after they get their grade back. Um, I give them, you know, it's about 20, 25 questions. They're yes, no. You can see some examples there where um, they identify what they did or didn't do in those three weeks leading up to the exam. Um, and I tell them everywhere there's a no, that's something that you can try next time. So again, it's helping to provide them with strategies that they might try um, if they weren't happy with their outcome. Um, and this allows me to also discuss how learning is an iterative process that mistakes are often a part of that process. And that what resilience is, it's not just picking yourself up when you fall, it's looking at how you fell, what you can learn from that fall, and um, 
you know, how that learning about that fall can prevent that you from falling next time or maybe making your landing a little bit softer. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Kim. Um, we actually have uh, an article on our Course Hero blog that goes into this in more detail if you're, if you're curious. Um, really wonderful. We're going to pass it along from Bay Path University, um, Tom Manella. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Hopefully you get some nuggets of useful information here. I'm going to present on an alternative assessment approach um, to exams, so a way to assess student learning that's novel and different from exams. Indulge me for a moment and just imagine how many times in your workplace setting has a supervisor asked you to follow them to a quiet room, handed you a stack of papers to fill out from memory, and gave you a set amount of time to do it. Your answer is probably never, and that's because exams are as far from real world as you can get. Uh, it's very unrealistic what we do in exams. It's not something that we encounter in the workplace really at all. More what we tend to do at our jobs is to take information that's been given to us by our colleagues and our supervisors and our co-workers, change it, modify it, evaluate it, critically think about it, come up with something new, and then give a deliverable back that represents our own thoughts and our own workings, our own understanding of that material. So that's really what my alternative assessment approach is all about, creating that real-world environment for our students. So it's fair to say that exams are not only unrealistic, but they're boring to grade, right? Essay exams are the same story that we read 15, 20, 25, 30 times. Uh, and given the challenges that we had with the COVID pandemic, uh, many of us found exams very, very difficult to administer. They're more prone to cheating. They need to be proctored in an online environment, and they weren't conducive to online learning at all. My alternative is called e-reports or electronic reports. And essentially, an e-report is a student-created video where they are collecting, curating, or creating images, figures, pictures, even animations that represent course content. And they're narrating that information back to you in their own words. The old adage that many of us live by is you don't fully understand something until you can explain it to someone else clearly in your own words, and that is the philosophy of e-reports. Students are taking core information that you've already taught them, and they're giving it back to you with their own understanding in these movies. So what I have at the bottom of the screen are three screenshots from some of the best e-reports that have come across my desk. All the way on the left, we see a beautiful representation of the formation of a clathrin-coated vesicle from a cell biology course that I teach. The student used uh, creation software. I'm not even sure what tool she used, but she created some of the best uh, visual representations of clathrin-coated vesicles and pits that I've seen anywhere, not only from students, but even in textbooks. In the middle, we see a student who used a Khan Academy approach to describe and illustrate how cells crawl in an act-independent fashion. Now, she narrated this and explained this process while she was drawing it in real time, so you can appreciate the mastery that she had to have had in order to accomplish that. All the way on the right, you see a student who created an animated sitcom. This was an episode where two roommates were explaining course content to one another and arguing about which one was more correct and which one understood that content uh, better than the other. She used an app called Plotagon for iOS, and it was, it was hysterical. The screenshot that I have right here is one roommate saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, you don't fully understand that. Uh, I actually spit coffee out onto my iPad screen while I was grading this. It was that humorous. It was that much fun. So e-reports do more mimic the real world environment. Students are taking course content from themselves, how they understand it. They're giving it back to you. This is really a PBL approach. You can think of these as projects that students create these over a number of weeks at the end of each unit. As I've already alluded to, they're very, very fun to grade uh, from the viewer's perspective, and they're perfect for remote learning because each is unique. Students can't cheat. They can't plagiarize an e-report because they are so unique and, and so specific. I'll also point out that as STEM transitions to STEAM, and we focus on science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics, these e-reports really allow students to express themselves creatively and artistically, leveraging some of the strengths that we not, might not see in their classroom otherwise. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, Course Hero was nice enough to feature this idea of e-reports in a recent article that they put out. Uh, the link to that article is there at the top of the screen. I'll also point out that there are links in that article to resources that might ease your transition to adopting e-reports, including the rubric that I use to grade my students' reports. You'll find all of those resources there. And so hopefully if this sounds like a reasonable idea, it'll be easily actionable and implementable by you. I guarantee you, your students will appreciate these assessments far more. They'll get so much more out of it, and it'll also ease your grading experience as well. You'll have a lot of fun. Thanks for your attention. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Um, always a, a, a fun project to, to, to dive into. We've been really excited about that on the Course Hero side. I am passing the mic next to the wonderful Melissa Haswell. Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Haswell. I teach at Davenport University in Michigan. I mainly teach at our satellite campus, which is mostly nursing students for, uh, going towards a bachelor's degree. So most of my students are working parents and they don't have a lot of time to spend uh, studying. And so over the 15 years I've been teaching, I've been trying to work on getting to know my students better and just trying to provide a better um, culture of care in my classroom. And so over the past few years, I've been working on having students keep journals and notebooks. Um, and I do have an article on this on the uh, Course Hero website as well on dialogue education. So I was really frustrated at how I was gonna transition this to online learning. And so I tapered my journal aspect a little bit, but I actually kept my other assignments the same. So I'll, I'll explain that a little bit. So there's two parts in the way that I'm making connections with students online. The first part is mainly I wanna connect with them on an individual basis. It's a little harder for my students to do synchronous work. So I've really had to focus on asynchronous teaching. So I connect with them individually in two ways. One is through a metacognitive journal. I gave them really explicit instructions and examples on what, what is metacognition and what I don't want them to give me in their journal. And so the first, the first three to four weeks of my 12 week class, I had them do a weekly journal and I just wanted to know what they were doing to complete the assignments. And that was about the time at the end of the four weeks was when we had our first exam. And so then they did a course, uh, a debrief journal after that. And so I could kind of guess at the results of the first exam for those that were giving me things I told them not to. So for example, I asked them not to tell me what they learned that week as far as topics. And many of them did. I also warned them that flashcards don't work when you're taking an online exam. And so many of them stuck with what they know to learn uh, anatomy, which was flashcards. Um, I think they quickly learned that the class is anatomy and physiology. And so I focus more on the physiology to, to get the content across. And so a lot of them were upset at their first exam. So each week I gave them tips on what they could do better. And so after the exam, I, I said, do you now want to rethink your flashcards? What can we do better? And so in the meantime, I also um, would give them assignments to help see ways that they could use to study and experiment with. But usually it seemed to take that first exam as their wake up call for those that weren't already trying the new things. So I wanted them to connect with the material also. And this was actually another way for them to connect with me since we couldn't do normal office hours. So I gave them assignments and these actually were the same assignments that I use when I teach in person. I just put them online. So I like to use tables to help students save time and organize material. So many of my students come in not understanding what they should study. They think we're going to trick them and so forth. And so I provided um, tables for them to organize material. And then I also would model concept mapping. So you can see this is actually one that I just drew on a mini whiteboard and took a snapshot with my phone. So I wanted to show them this is something quick and easy they could do at home on their own. And then um, I would give them feedback on these assignments. And then the last thing I would do would be um, after they completed these tables or concept maps, I would give them a case study. So they actually had to apply the physiological concepts 
to a case study, so a patient, if you will. And so in the case study assessments, they would always have two attempts at these, and I would give them extensive feedback and hints at, you know, what you just told me is going to kill your patient type of thing. And so um, I like to use the University of Buffalo case study site, which is uh, the link I put on the slide. And so I would just adapt those into a PowerPoint and add video. So it was kind of part of my lecture and part part assignment at the same time. So they had to work their way through watching videos and answering questions. And I look forward to any questions that you have. Um, that's, that's my two tips for connecting with students online. Awesome, thanks Melissa. We were really excited about that. We've been hearing a lot from educators moving online that case studies have been crucial in, in data adaptation. So really appreciative of that presentation. I will now pass it to the always entertaining Nelson Kraus. And Nelson, I think you may be muted. Hopefully, Nelson can join us. Okay, well, we'll check in with Nelson in just a moment. Uh, for now, Sam, why don't we, uh, yes, just jump ahead and uh, I will invite Sarah Finch uh, to join us from Sinclair. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I look forward to chatting with you. Um, I've been teaching at Sinclair Community College um, for about six years now. I've been teaching for 13 overall, and the class that I love to teach the most is definitely non-majors biology. Um, I love it because those kids are probably never going to be taking a science class again, and I want to make sure that they have the really important concepts about their bodies, about the earth, climate change, things like that. So um, I have been using a flipped learning method in my classroom for about five years now in this non-majors class and recently have also switched to using OERs, so the Open Educational Resources. Um, and that's what I spoke with Coursero about as well, and I can talk to you more about that some other time. But typically, because I've made these changes, I've been tweaking my class over and over again, and now we know we're mostly remote, so we have to tweak again. So this is just a good opportunity to find things that work. Typically in my classroom, you can see some pictures here. Um, I try to make things as fun and hands-on uh, whenever possible. So this is actually a lecture class. It's not a lab class, although it looks like it. We do um, diffusion experiments looking at uh, different temperatures. You can see that they built a DNA model um, of a candy model uh, made of DNA. And you can see the pieces. So um, in the picture, the Twizzlers are the backbone, the marshmallows are the hydrogen bonds, and the gumdrops are the nucleotides. So it's nice because they actually have to um, figure out which bases go together and then they have to twist it and they can see that. And, and I have to tell you, I get such good feedback about this. You can go to the next slide now. Um, so these are just some tips. So again, it's, it's a challenge that we're going from a situation where you're in class with the students, you can engage, you can do all this good work with them, but now how do we do that in a remote situation? So I've been using, again, Zoom to, to teach us, uh -huh. I've been doing too. And I put a link on here if you're interested, um, how to use breakout rooms. I think breakout rooms are really essential because I put students in groups and I like them to work together. So sort of building team over the whole time. Um, so if you don't know how to do that, that's definitely something to look into. Um, I do, um, I didn't do this in the spring, but I think I'm gonna do it now is require students to have their video screens on. I think that's gonna make it a lot easier for me to teach and for them to interact with me. And I have to figure out how to work that into a grade somehow. I'm still thinking about that. But with these Zoom sessions, what you can do is take the classroom things and actually integrate them into um, your Zoom sessions. I have a, a Zoom meeting um, that I'm gonna have to do with students that's gonna be almost two hours long. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's gonna kill everyone. So I'm going to integrate stretch breaks. Um, I like to do meditation with my classes. I actually do that in all my face-to-face -face classes. We do a meditation at the beginning to sort of center ourselves. So I'm gonna take some time to do that. Um, you can always do your icebreakers with students and then all of the group activities. So I'm trying to take all of my in-class activities and then actually 
um, do them at home. So there is some requirement for students to get materials. So again, if I want the students to do the uh, building the DNA uh, candy model, they're going to have to pick those up at the store. Um, and we actually also are entertaining the idea of uh, creating kits that we can send home to our students. Um, so that might be something that we can include and we're looking into the feasibility of doing that. Um, but the other pictures you can see here are um, some of the things that I would do in class would be, again, Punnett Square races, um, finding ways to think about um, cellular respiration. How many calories do I burn if I do this? And um, trying to help students um, understand what's going in and out of your bodies, um, making pedigrees, they can do those in breakout sessions. Um, and then even the experiment looking at surface tension, you can do that on pennies. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with things that they have around their house. And the more interactive we can make it, the better off um, that will be. So, and I, I look forward to questions if you have those as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, active learning always important and something I struggled with as an educator to implement online, certainly so very appreciative. I believe we have uh, Nelson uh, sorted out if we can run back to, um, to those slides. And I will pass the mic to Nelson Krause. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. I ran away. Um, had to use the restroom, sorry. Uh, my, my perspective is really simple and straightforward after I'm old, uh, as you might see. So I've been teaching or facilitating learning for 50 plus years. And now I, I've teaching intro anatomy and physiology I just think that we're burying, we're dumping content on our students. Stop with the content. Just lighten the content, lecture less, question more, and then become a coach. I go over at UWindy and I watch up back in the old days, before COVID, <laughs> and I, I watch basketball practice, and I watch the coach, and he's not running the plays, he's helping them run the plays. So, coach, and then next slide. Uh, I've come to the conclusion there are 10 keys to learning and I like pictures and ways to help me remember revolving camera rev cam 10 keys to learning repetition 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 did I say repetition <laughs> Uh, emotion, both positive and negative. I do things now to, pardon me, piss my students off because it gets them really involved. And visualization, vocalization, I, I have students saying thing in class and, and the same stuff in class virtually or otherwise like it was third grade and communicate, conceptualize, collaborate, associate, A, existing understanding with new material movement. The human mind works better when the body is moving and memorization and in any what i've learned and a mentor helped me understand this in any learning situation the ones doing the most work are the ones doing the most learning so create environments where your students are working and you're not that's it. 
Wonderful. Thanks so much, Nelson. Uh, it's been uh, fun to see as you're developing that, uh, that acronym. And I think it's not at all unintentional that memorization is last in the sequence um, there, but oftentimes we have it first and foremost. Um, I am now going to pass things off to Mariana Burks. Um, and you can join us on the stage here, Mariana. Hi, welcome first. It's wonderful to share this virtual space with all of you so that we can actually provide you actionable steps to be even more effective educators as we are all navigating the online realm of, of teaching. My name is Mariana Burks. I'm a biology instructor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I am in the heartland of our corn huskers. <laughs> and so um, I, I, and I'm, I'm going to actually use this as I, as I present to you all um, what I utilize in my instruction and what I, what I perceive to be effective for students um, in their long-term goals for learning science and biology, but also to, to make that learning fun for our students. Um, when, when we're often teaching, we're really performing for our students so that we can transfer the knowledge that we've gained. Um, in, our, in our quest to be professionals and, and professors and instructors, but also to, to make that learning fun. And so um, what I've utilized in the six years that I've been in, in uh, instruction at the university is the five E's of instruction. Now, this, this whole concept for me has really um, been fruitful. I've received feedback from students on evaluations regarding how we've implemented um, our learning in the classrooms. Um, I've seen other colleagues that have actually presented um, all of these concepts and, and have incorporated that into their classrooms as well. And so um, how do we do this virtually? That's, that's the question, that's the quest. Um, my most powerful moments are in the classroom with my students. Um, I'm, I have a Louisiana accent, so that again probably engages my students in terms of, wow, it's interesting to just hear you talk, Ms. Burks. So what, what essentially I do in those five E's of engagement is I engage my students. Um, I prompt them with a question. Sometimes we don't even start the lesson um, with just focused on biology. I'll ask them to go and get a think item. So in that case, um, I picked up these wonderful stress uh, relievers, and I will ask students to actually bring to our classroom on Zoom a think object. object. What have you been thinking about or what have you used throughout the week that has been a source of, of, of stress relief for you? So by actually prompting um, with something that may not be biology related, I can then actually segue into an actual question that I can put into the chat because we do realize not all students can have access um, or the bandwidth to actually be able to have their videos on. That's okay. We can still engage those students by having them respond in the actual chat um, feature itself. Um, the next actual process is to explore. Again, we're in a virtual space, we're online. What can we actually prompt our students to go out just within the actual surroundings of where they are and explore something that may be biology related, especially with the content for that, that, that concept or the unit that we're covering um, for the week. So again, just actually having them go out, take some of that content, explore it, connect it. And so um, being able to just make that useful with what we're dealing with and how we're actually trying to make um, that learning meaningful for our students. Um, then we actually go into a little bit of explaining. I don't like hearing myself talk for longer than 10 minutes. How can we expect our students to want to hear us speak that long? Again, holding their attention, but making that meaningful connection with them by explaining and giving more accuracy to what the material that we're trying to get them to actually have a good understanding of. Um, then by that point, um, what would I usually like to do in the classroom is have my students draw. Um, my grandmother was an artist, um, my daughter is an artist, and so just taking something that is so wordy, so um, in-depth, so conceptual, drawing that out. Um, we can actually elaborate um, what our students are learning by having them actually illustrate that learning. 
um, they can actually now take terms and concepts and apply that to something that they can actually literally write out on a worksheet. Have them reflect on what they're learning. Um, I plan to actually use Yellow Dig in um, my, my, my Canvas course because I'll be remote uh, this fall semester. Do a writing reflection, um, giving our students the opportunity to elaborate on their own learning. It doesn't have to be correct. Again, just giving them those actual moments to um, express what it is that they think that they're understanding and they're learning. And then finally, we move to what we will, of course, have to do in, that, in those actual uh, formal assessments and summative assessments. We need to evaluate exactly where our students are with their learning. Again, we don't want to punish our students. We want to move them to a place where they feel confident in their learning, where they feel comfortable in their learning. And so again, what I've always expressed to my students is, remember, the, these formal assessments are to give you feedback as a student, to let you know where you are and where you've come with your learning, and to actually help to um, correct some of the misconceptions along the way where you may not have been as clear in your understanding on the material as well as the concepts themselves. Um, again, we use the Canvas format, uh, a platform to be able to actually provide maybe short quizzes. I also use the Mastering Biology that is tied with our textbook. Um, again, I like my students to actually practice um, their understanding of what they're learning. So again, I will assign um, certain questions that will align with the chapter units throughout the week. Um, I give them a week's time to be able to work on that. I'm very flexible with my students in terms of if they need more time. I'm working with a lot of first gen students. Um, I also am the science specialist for our TRIO programs at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So again, in terms of those five E's of instruction, um, again, I, I may not go in a certain order for our students with that, just, just to feel organic and have a good flow. So um, again, we appreciate having you in our space to be able to present to you um, some things that we hopeful, we're hope, hopeful that um, will be successful for you as an educator. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Mariana. And when we were discussing this session, I mentioned that I'm a former English instructor and even for me, that kind of very neat lesson planning structure um, would have been so useful um, rather than the chaos that I created. Um, lastly, uh, I'm really excited uh, to introduce Samantha Giordano Muga, um, who's going to be giving our final lightning talk. So Sam, you can join us here. Hi everybody, thanks for listening today with me um, and hanging in there for the last talk here, talking about how teamwork can still be functional in um, the remote setting and these hybrid courses we're talking about and of course in person. So um, as many of you know, teamwork really does benefit the students. It improves student learning. It breaks up the lecture as a lot of our previous speakers have talked about. Giving those short lectures and then allowing the students to actually apply things are really great. And team activities allow students to do this. As a faculty member, I'm going to be a little bit selfish here and talk about how teamwork has really helped me to have to grade less. I have really large classes. Um, I have over 100 students sometimes. And if I were to grade every single assignment for every single student all the time, I might not be able to give really great feedback. But if I have 100 students and I put them in teams of five, I only really have 20 assignments I have to grade pretty really rigorously, and I can give that whole team feedback. On top of which, I'm a really huge people person, and I love the fact that when my students are working in teams, I can kind of go around, talk to each group, and get to know each group, and really make sure that we're building the instructor-student relationship that I really, really appreciate. I want to give you guys a couple of tips on how to implement this, and I have a second slide that I'm going to have them flip to in a moment, and I'll let you know when, Sam, but that kind of have some more practical tips. But I kind of want to talk about the challenges right now we're dealing with with this COVID-19. Doing teamwork in person is gonna be really, really hard with this six foot difference, right? It, it's, it's pretty challenging. If we go to the next option, many instruction um, or, or universities or institutions are now moving to this hybrid course, um, course um, kind of design. And at first I was freaked out. There was no way I could do teams with half my class at home and half my class in person. What do I do? Oh my gosh. And it actually turned out that this is great. If I have half of my team at home on the computer, and half of my team in person, I can have some of the students put their computers in the center, and now I can have this remote, 
plus in-person team at the same time. And when this happens, I'm actually able to go around and talk to my teams very similarly to how I would with my face mask on and my face shield. And I'll go around and talk to them and answer questions that they might have. But I'm also getting to interact with the students at home in a little bit more detail. Because as the students are doing their activity and different groups are raising their hand, I walk over and now I'm interacting with two or three students in class, but also with those three, two or three students that are at home. So again, I'm able to continue to maintain that um, discussion that I really like having with my students. So it is feasible to have a team with hybrid. Um, if you're doing online coursework, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about asynchronous teams and why I think that this is kind of more important. If you're dealing with completely online um, teams, when you make your team, I know a lot of us wanna make teams that are diverse in, in regard to race, gender, um, great GPA, etc. If you have an asynchronous course group, you have to make the main focus of your teams be when the students can actually meet. Again, kind of going back to what someone um, earlier in this session was talking about with that if your students are asynchronous, it's hard to find a time they all can meet. So my teams for asynchronous online lectures are, or asynchronous courses are all based on when the students can meet. And that works really, really well. And I usually split it up into like morning, afternoon, and evening. So if you could like to meet between 8 and 12, 12 to 5, or after 5 p.m., and that has worked really well. Another tip I'm going to give you is to have your students all record a small five-minute video after the team activity has been done. If you don't grade the team activity right away, um, you're actually able to go back and review these five-minute videos, and you can actually find out what the students don't want to don't want to do it, uh, what the students don't understand. And this has really helped me to make sure I'm reaching out and addressing student concerns. Um, if you would flip to the next slide, Sam. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of other tips that I wanted to throw out there about integrating teams in your curriculum. And these are some things that I've kind of um, uncovered myself and that some are, are written out there in the literature. Diverse teams are really good, but they can also be alienating. So making sure that when you're making your teams that they're fair and that they actually sometimes have two students who look alike, um, particularly when you're dealing with underrepresented minorities, helps to give those underrepresented minority students a voice. Um, and, and this was something I learned at my first team experience I had had, you know, I called it the United Nations. I had the teams being very, very diverse and certain groups didn't talk at all. And actually having a buddy in certain teams has really improved the overall learning um, uh, process. I really like um, that if you talk about asking questions, you can really ask more challenging questions when you create teams because the students have to work together to answer a question. And I've got an example here dealing with cell cycle that you can kind of look at yourself that I think are um, pretty helpful. And um, my last thing that I really would push for this is um, make sure that you're doing some sort of team assessment and it doesn't have to be for a grade or it can just be for a completion grade to ask the students how they're hand working in their teams. This allows for you to either intervene if there's a problem with a team that, and there's students that are feeling alienated within the team, but also helps to teach students this transferable skill of teamwork. And that's really one of the parts of the hidden curriculum in our program is surely teaching the students how to work in teams and to learn certain transferable skills. So um, with that, I'm, I'm done and thank you for listening and I'm here for any questions you may have. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, panelists, if you don't mind, uh, I might ask all of you to turn your cameras back on. Um, as we expected, it's a, it's a very kind of, uh, it's a sprint this session. And so we have five minutes for questions. What's been really delightful though, is I've noticed um, a lot of questions happening in the chat and the panelists have been kind enough to share a lot of uh, uh, written ideas, written answers to those questions. So hopefully that's been helpful as well. Um, I want to address a few questions that I saw uh, come up uh, one is for Tom. Uh, we had a few questions surrounding um, grading those e-reports uh, and, and maybe especially kind of how to do so efficiently if you have a larger class. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so the course that I implement e-reports in is a junior level, 300 level cell and molecular biology course, which typically enrolls about 30 students. Sometimes we even get close to 35. So that's not like university lecture hall big, but that's big. And so a few tips that I've learned along the way was to cap students' e-report length. So they tell, I tell them that they can't go beyond 20 minutes without special permission from me. So that's one. Another thing, which I'll never tell the students, is that I watch it at 2x speed. 
So that cuts a 20 minute e report down to 10 minutes. And most of my classic exams were essay based. So I was spending about 10 minutes per exam probably to, to grade it in the old school way. And now if I'm watching a 20 minute e report at 2x speed, I'm spending 10 minutes grading those. So it's pretty much been an even wash for me there. Great. Um, thank you for that. Uh, another question was for uh, Mariana. And uh, I, I remember there was a question asking whether those five E's are as easily implemented in an asynchronous course. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Um, actually, um, it, you, you can go in any order that feels comfortable for you and your students. Um, what I've often done with my students is um, I will prompt them with questions. What do you, what do we need to focus on more um, for our next unit? Do we need to elaborate more? Do we need to engage more? Do we need to explore more? Um, I believe that you can make that hybrid, or you can make that as fluid as you actually need that to be so that it fits your students' needs. Um, my sections are pretty small, but at the same time, I find that giving them that flexibility is really what pulls them into that, that, um, that engagement, um, especially giving them that freedom to feel like they can connect with the information and the material that I'm, I'm intending for them to get a good grasp and understanding of. So again, I, I come from that base of um, making it more organic for your students, but also really pull and ask them what they need so that you can meet all the needs of, of their learner, if that answers that question. Wonderful. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, we may have had some sound issues, but appreciate uh, uh, folks' uh, patience with that. Uh, uh, a really insightful answer. Um, we have two minutes left. Um, very quickly, uh, Kim, we had a question related uh, to your activity and kind of how students typically respond um, to, to kind of having this much autonomy over, over that learning process. So, um, Yeah, you mean in terms well, and so first I'll say students express a lot of gratitude for this assignment. I've been surprised at how even my high achieving students um, have appreciated it. Um, and I've had students who come back, you know, a year later showing me their schedules that they're still employing this method of time management. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, as professors, a lot of us um, were here because maybe we were very type A. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think it took me a while to appreciate not everyone has this idea of, oh, I should make a list um, and, oh, I should assess, you know, what maybe I did wrong and what I can do next time. And so this idea of providing equity through teaching these um, study strategies, it has such a big impact um, on my students. And I think it also sends the message to your students that you really, um, um, you value them, you appreciate their effort and you wanna help them um, as a student, as a human being, not just learning, you know, for me, molecular cell biology, but helping them learn how to learn. And so I, I think there's so many different angles uh, through which this process is important in my students. For my students, I actually go through this four different times throughout the course of the class. So I'm constantly reminding them because I think, you know, sometimes we forget that when you tell students something one day, I'm the same way. If you tell me something one day, I'm not necessarily going to remember it three weeks from now. So I think it is important to have redundancy when something is so impactful and so important. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that uh, uh, was a, a lovely answer. I, I maybe worded it poorly uh, uh, in, in uh, trying to um, reiterate what the attendee had asked, um, but very well said. Um, we are now at time. Thank you for joining us for this sprint. I'm seeing a lot of reactions in the chat that are really grateful for how actionable um, and, and kind of bite-sized these ideas are. Hopefully, you've got some ideas that you can kind of you know, grab and put into a syllabus for the fall. As I said, I highly encourage you to find uh, each of these professors on the Course Hero uh, platform. They'll have resources, they'll have rubrics, a lot of things that can help you to implement these effectively. Um, and you will also be able to connect with them directly there. I encourage you to reach out. I saw some emails being shared. So please, um, uh, each of these uh, instructors has been generous to offer their additional insight after the session. And um, I'm sure they would all be happy to connect with you. So we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you all uh, uh, to our panelists. We, it was really wonderful um, and, and wonderful to work with you. So um, we will send everyone off to their next sec.
uh, to their next session. Um, but thanks again for joining us.